So I, I just have a few uh, remarks uh, this morning because I take these um, uh, opportunities seriously. Uh, the risk is that because I haven't uh, been part of the conference uh, yesterday and can't today, uh, I will simply be repeating things that are already said or that you take as um, simple. But um, bear with me and um, be kind. You know, that's what I want to begin by saying that um, uh, this is a great conference. Um, as I will say, it's on one of the most important questions of the time. Uh, I want you to know that at Columbia, we've made um, many efforts to try to make uh, free speech, free press uh, be um, a core part of the university's mission. So a number of years ago, um, I established a, a global a freedom of expression initiative and hired Anya's Calamard to lead that in a belief that the new globalization of the world and the global communication system require uh, those of us who really have focused on First Amendment kinds of perspectives take a, a more international global perspective. We have um, uh, Columbia Global Reports, which is edited by Nick Lemon uh, out of a feeling that long-form journalism uh, is a, um, a declining activity and universities need to step into the, the breach and there are fantastic uh, books on global issues. We have the Tau Center for Digital Journalism and the Brown Center for Media Innovation, uh, but we have the Knight Institute. And as Jamil said, uh, that was a partnership between uh, Alberto Ibarguen and me in Columbia and uh, the Knight Foundation to set up something within the university so that it would be um, as eternal as uh, universities uh, are. And that will focus on uh, public education, on research, on uh, thinking, and on litigation. And this is something that I think is somewhat unique uh, in the world of universities because it is taking uh, not just a an opportunity for students to be educated in a clinic, but taking it as a mission of the university to participate in the world, in this case through litigation and policy making in areas of, of great uh, importance. The best thing, um, um, one of the best things I've done uh, is to hire Jamil Jaffer, and one of the best things he's done is to hire his team, and it's been a spectacular um, uh, opening of this institute, couldn't be more proud. So the subject, <laughs> the subject of this conference is one of the areas of greatest significance to the future of the First Amendment, and indeed to the very idea of democracy. People broadly are aware of that significance, and I find myself over and over again asked what I think the First Amendment has to say about the role of social media platforms and search engines in our society. I confess to being puzzled and uncertain. I therefore have no recommendations to offer in these brief welcoming remarks. But I do have a framing of the problem to suggest that I think is frequently overlooked or ignored. The new technology of the internet has gone through two stages. The first was characterized by an almost unconditional enthusiasm for the ways in which the new technology would widen the possibilities for participation in public debate, and in doing so to bring us substantially closer to the ideal of the marketplace of ideas. No longer with the differential between the voices of the privileged elite who control the mass media, among other organs of communication, and the rest of the citizenry be so great. Exactly 100 years ago, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., very close to 100 years ago, exactly, argued in eloquent and prophetic language that the, quote, natural and logical impulse we all share for intolerance and for persecuting those who disagree with our beliefs should give way to the chaotic openness of free debate, even for ideas we detest, 
which would offer the best test of truth as falsehoods over time would be defeated by those truths. Now, a very simple idea, but profound. Now we are in stage two of the new technology. That elementary premise that citizens could be trusted to sort out truth from falsehoods and evil ideas is being called into question. The easier activation of hate and intolerance, the manipulation of opinion by targeted message, messages, and inflammatory misrepresentations and propaganda, the void for contrary points of view, the menace of foreign interference, all of these and other threats to decent and civil public debate about public issues have been magnified to the point where the very core idea of freedom of speech and press is perceived to be naive and even outdated. When Mark Zuckerberg testifies before Congress that Facebook will not reject demonstrably false political advertising, shockwaves of astonishment ripple through the free speech and press community. Is Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook like the public square where neo-Nazis and white supremacists can speak freely? Or do we expect of them that they will act like editors of the traditional mainstream press? Not so long ago, and continuing today, though it now seems like a different world, the mainstream media, such as the Washington Post, would always have a threshold of accuracy and decency before acceptance of publication? Or does the vast scale of the new technology, which is only controllable through imperfect algorithms, make this not even a sensible question? Is that a better rationale for, the Facebook, for Facebook to rely on than some ill-suited and naive notion of free speech and no censorship? This is where I have to admit they have no current resolution in my own mind, but what I do know is that we have confronted these problems before with new technologies, and we do have experience in the First Amendment tradition, now only really one century along. The prime example of the new technology of communication in the last century is, of course, broadcasting, first radio and then television. What is important here is that this new technology was also extolled for what it could bring to the marketplace of ideas, sound and visual, but it too was also profoundly feared. Feared as a means of using the more compelling and therefore manipulative senses of sound and, and images for controlling and distorting public opinion, as happened with radio, in Hitler's regime in the 1930s. Early on, as we know, the federal government stepped in and seized overarching and systemic control. The pretense, and this is what I think it was, was that the system under which a federal agency would issue licenses and regulate, quote, in the public interest convenience and necessity, that this was inevitable because of the scarcity of airwaves. But this was a fiction. As economists pointed out as early as 1960, it was entirely possible, and one would expect under a traditional free speech thinking, we would prefer it was possible to divide up the spectrum and auction off the stations in a private market. But that was deemed unacceptable given the perceived risks of this newly this new, incredibly powerful medium. Decades of federal intervention to limit private power in the medium and to expand the range of voices available through that medium followed. Eventually, the system reached the Supreme Court and supported by the print media, journalism organizations, ACLU, and liberals generally the court unanimously upheld as self-evident that unchecked private power in such a powerful medium could not be tolerated. 
Now, I say all this not because I think it was right, although I have argued since the 1970s that it was and has been, nor because I think it is a perfect analogy to the current questions of regulating social media platforms such as Facebook, though I do think it is fairly close, but rather because I believe that it is at the very least relevant. Because the First Amendment tradition is shown to be far more complex than people typically realize, it offers a starting point, and because it, helps to it to always helps to examine concrete examples that show the current situation is not completely unprecedented. In Abrams, Holmes ended his remarks by noting that the First Amendment, as he would read it, is an experiment. One can't help but see that happening in the ways in which the print and electronic media were treated in the last century, and now into this one. There has been more fluidity, more creativity, and more of a spirit of trying out different approaches than we often think. The internet and its progeny are not the first new technology of communication to burst upon the First Amendment scene, nor will they be the last. What we choose to do with it in First Amendment terms can tap into different parts, therefore, of the First Amendment traditions public square, the print media, or the electronic media. And it undoubtedly will produce a new tradition and experiment of its own. I am not sure what that will look like or should look like. But what you can't say is that we haven't been here before. That at least frames the debate and the possibilities a little differently. The First Amendment really is an experiment. Thank you very much.